the cornerstone of the Christian faith. <coughs> Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 12. He says, Now if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is without foundation, and so is your faith. In addition, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified about God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Therefore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have placed our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation, the cornerstone of the Christian faith. And because of this, folks, it is also the target of Satan's greatest attacks against the church. Why? Because, as Paul writes, if Jesus was not resurrected from the dead, the life-giving power of the gospel message has been eliminated. The deity of Christ has been eliminated. Salvation from sin has been eliminated. And there is no eternal life. A lady sent this question into a forum group. Dear sirs, our preacher said on Easter that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that the disciples had nursed him back to health. What do you think, sincerely, bewildered? The leader of the forum group responded in this way. Dear bewildered, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, and then run a spear through his side. Put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. <laughs> Sincerely, Pastor Charles. In our text, Paul is contemplating the dismal consequences that would arise if we only have a dead Christ. Nothing to preach, no gospel message, no hope of deliverance from sin, no assurance of immortality, and no assurance of life after death. Paul tells us in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 15, if we have placed our hope in Christ for this life only, he said we should be pitied more than anyone. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then those who believe are believing an empty gospel, nourishing an empty faith, and will die clinging to an empty hope. If Christ did not live past the grave, those who place their trust in Him cannot hope to live either. Let me tell you folks, Christ has been bodily raised from the dead. Amen. And because of that, the resurrection of the dead is the new reality for mankind. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen. The resurrection of Christ Jesus means the resurrection for humanity for they are inseparably linked together. If Christ is raised, let me tell you, church, there is a resurrection for all the dead. I want to take a closer look at Paul's message to the Corinthians here for a few moments. 
He begins by posing a question concerning the concept of a resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul's question reveals that an inconsistency was developing within the church and the teachings within the church. And things were circulating, these false truths, concerning the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that denied a resurrection of the dead. Christ, folks, forged the way to a bodily resurrection of the dead through his own resurrection. Romans 6 speaks of the unity Christ has drawn himself into with his people, maintaining that in and through Christ's death, Christ's burial, and Christ's resurrection, you and I are bound to Christ in his death. You and I are bound to Christ in His burial. For those who are in Christ are a new creation. Therefore, we are bound together. And if we are bound together in His death, if we are bound together in His burial, folks, we are bound together in His resurrection. Amen. Hallelujah, church. Amen. Romans 6, 5, Paul writes, For if we have been joined with Him in the very likeness of His death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Now verse 12 here that we're looking at would lead us to infer that a group of false teachers had invaded the church with this idea that there would not be a resurrection from the dead. Now Greek philosophical thinking was very strong in these days, and the teaching was very strong. The concept of a resurrected body went counter to these tenets that the Greek philosoph uh, philosophers were teaching. While they held to the immortality of the soul, they denied any teaching of a resurrection of the body. They found it to be a repugnant teaching. In addition, the Sadducees, which were a group of the Jewish leadership of the day, they absolutely denied a resurrection from the dead. And they taught this, and they were possibly at this very moment in time exerting this same influence into the Corinthian church that Paul was writing to. Let me tell you, church, the simple fact is that Satan stands strongly opposed to God's plan and he is going to do anything and everything in his power to offset, to hinder, or to thwart the work and the promises of the living God. And therefore, any time he can lie to us and to deceive us in any way within the church, he has planted these seeds of deception, and there are those within the pew of the church who will fall prey to them and believe in them and will allow this type of teaching to become a part of their life. The Bible clearly indicates a bodily resurrection from the dead as we saw in Jesus Christ. So as Paul continues, he strives to explain the consequences of no resurrection. In his attempt to confront the false teachings concerning the resurrection, Paul now changes his argument for the resurrection. He begins by posing the logical consequences of doubt and the consequences of denial of a bodily resurrection, a very strong thing that was going on at that time, and it's going on in our world today as well. <clears throat> in verse 13, Paul shares that it's, the, it's only logical to assume that there is no res if there is no resurrection, then even Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised in verse 13. In other words, if the dead can't rise, Christ didn't rise since it was Christ's resurrection that initiated man's resurrection. If a man can't rise, then it's because 
It's cause Christ's resurrection didn't occur as well. The denial of a bodily resurrection, let me tell you, it's a denial of Christ's resurrection. Paul then explains the consequence in verse 14, that being our preaching and our faith has no foundation. In other words, if this is true today, you and I are all wasting our time being here today. I'm wasting my time standing in this pulpit. You're wasting your time sitting in the pew today if Christ be not raised from the dead. Because we have no hope, church. If Christ Jesus is not alive today, you and I have no hope. Now we've sung, we've heard it sung, that He's alive. Do you believe He's alive? Amen. Do you know that He's alive? Amen. Praise God. Paul says in verse 14, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is without foundation, and so is your faith. You see, the heart of the gospel is Christ's death and resurrection on our behalf. The time he spent walking upon this earth didn't save us, folks. Oh, he did great things. He did great wonders. He carried out great miracles. But nothing he did at that time could save us, folks. He had to get up on that cross. He had to submit to death on the cross. And then he had to die on that cross as the weight of our sin was placed upon him. He died for those sins for us. Then we believe he was taken down from that cross and he was placed into a tomb. On Resurrection Sunday, though, the angels rolled back that stone. Jesus Christ was gone. He was gone. The tomb was empty, praise God. And he is alive today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus didn't conquer sin. He didn't conquer hell. He didn't conquer death. Indicating that these three great evils would forever be man's conquerors. Without the resurrection, the gospel would be an empty, hopeless message of meaningless nonsense. Unless Jesus Christ conquered sin and death, making a way for men to follow likewise into that victory, there is no gospel message to proclaim today. There is no good news outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, church. Paul shares in verse 15 that denial of the resurrection means that every apostle and every other early leader in the church is deemed to be a false witness and a liar. He says, in addition, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we've testified about God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up if in fact the dead are not raised. What motive would the early church fathers have for lying and deceiving and carrying on this message into the early church knowing the persecution and the death that would follow for them all? At some point, wouldn't they have finally said, all right, I give before you take my head, before you crucify me, before you hang me, before you kill me. All right, it's not true. But they all went to their death believing and proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ, the burial of Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of the Savior. Let me tell you, there was absolutely nothing for these folks to gain by continuing a story that wasn't true. By carrying forth this story, they had nothing to gain. They really had everything to lose. History has revealed that every apostle other than John and many of the early church fathers were executed for bearing witness to the risen Lord. Were it not true, would all of these have been willing to die? Wouldn't some of them have broken? We know they stood by their testimony. Why? Because they knew it was true. They had walked with Him and talked with Him. They had touched Him. They had eaten with Him following His resurrection before His ascension. There was no doubt in their minds that Jesus Christ was the risen Savior. They declared that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God. They declared that He died, that He was buried, that He rose again, and that there was eternal salvation for all who would believe in Him. 
Paul reinforces the, his conclusion of verses 13 and 14 over in 16 and 17 again where he says, For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, church, let me tell you today, your faith is worthless. And you're still in your sins. God help us. If that's all we've got, church, God help us. Praise God, it's not all we've got today. We've got the truth of the Word of God. A dead Christ would be the most disastrous consequence from which all other consequences would result. There is an inseparable connection between the dead being raised and Christ being raised. If the dead being bodily raised is impossible, the Scripture tells us, Paul tells us, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is impossible. He reiterates that fact that having faith in an unresurrected Christ is worthless and those who believe remain in their sins just like all humanity. Finally, Paul declares the most disastrous consequence lies in the fact stated in verse 18, therefore those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. Let me tell you, the glorious thing about a memorial service for a loved one who we know Christ Jesus was their Lord is the fact that we know we shall see them once again. Amen. We shall see them and be with them forever and ever and ever. You see, that's the hope we hang on to. That's the hope of the gospel message. That's what this book is all about, is that God wants a relationship with His people. God wants to come into relationship. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to fellowship with all of His creation. He loves us. He cares about us. We heard it sung by the choir this morning in a beautiful way, expressed in such a glorious way. That is the hope we all hang on to today, is the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. the resurrected Savior. Finally, Paul arrives at this conclusion that no resurrection, no hope. Verse 19 provides us a glimpse of Paul's final concluding argument to this section of Scripture here that we have before us. He says, if we placed our hope in Christ for this life only, if there is nothing beyond this life, he says, we've got to be pitied more than everyone else. <coughs> he says, Lord, help us all. Why is it that Paul feels believers are to be pitied if the only hope for them is for the here and now? Let me tell you something. Being a Christian in the New Testament times wasn't a cakewalk, folks. The Bible tells us it meant being ostracized from your family. It meant being persecuted. It meant suffering, social, financial, and economic hardship. And this is the same thing going on around the world for our brothers and sisters. Many of them are ostracized by their friends and families for their faith when they put their faith into Jesus Christ. Amen. They lose their jobs. They lose their homes. They lose everything. And many of them die for their faith. Are they dying for a dead Savior? Are they dying for no hope? No, they are dying because they believe the promises of the Word of God that says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Amen. Folks, let me tell you, that's a glorious promise for us. Amen. Jesus paid the price. Thank you, Lord. He took the death that should have been ours. He took the pain. He took the shame for you and I. What should have been ours, He took for us. Yes. We simply place our trust and our faith in Him and for us, His salvation. Let me tell you, if there was no resurrection, we have no Savior today. We have no forgiveness today. There's no gospel message. There's no meaningful faith. There's no life and there's no hope. I'll tell you, if 
He's not alive. There's no Christian life. It's all a mockery. It's all a charade. It's a tragic joke on all humanity if Christ Jesus' body was stolen that day. Disappeared somehow that day. Listen as I close. A Christian has no Savior but Christ. We have no Redeemer but Christ. There is no salvation but in and through Christ. Therefore, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, if He's not alive today, the Christian life is lifeless and worthless. <coughs> Christianity, though, folks, listen, it's set apart from all other world religions by the fact that we serve a living Redeemer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Woo! Amen. And I ought to do something to you. Yeah. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. No matter what He is the hope. He's my hope today. I pray He's your hope today. For church, our faith lies in a risen Lord. And there's no reason to believe anything other than the truth that today Jesus is alive and because He lives today, we shall all one day rise to be with Him Amen. forever. Praise the Lord. The resurrection is the very cornerstone upon which all of the rest of the Christian faith rests. There is no resurrection. There is no Christianity, folks. The best way to wrap up this message today is asking a simple question. Where are you going when you die? Do you have hope for a journey's end with the living Jesus? As you pass through the dark shadows of this life, do you fear what is yet to come? Or do you walk with a confidence that home is just on the other side? Knowing that the very moment you take your last breath upon this earth, you breathe in that fresh breath of glory. Where's your hope today? Jesus alone offers us hope. Because Jesus lives, we can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone because I know, I know He holds my future. Do you know that today? Amen. Are you convinced of that fact today? If you're not, if you're not, today needs to be the day that you declare Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Today needs to be the day that you invite Jesus Christ to come into your life. You surrender to Him and you say, Jesus Christ, forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins and my sinful way of living. And I ask you to forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, and take over my life today.